going to have to add up to flow one plus flow two. Um, we're going to have we're going to look at the concentration in this tank, concentration in this tank, and we're going to have to have nice matching things. Whatever comes into this tank, so flow one plus flow three better equal what's going out in flow four. Similarly, flow two uh, plus flow five better be equal to flow three. So we're going to have these balance equations because we're going to just like in our lake problem, we're going to assume that we have constant volumes in each of these particular uh, uh, tanks. Okay, so what we want to do then is set up the differential equations, uh, assuming you've got some initial concentrations, C10 and a C20 in each of these two lake, two ones, and what happens. And so the, um, just like when we had two rivers flowing in, it wasn't immediately obvious what the equilibrium situation is, for example. Um, okay, so we'd like to set this up and see how to solve it, and it's just going to be uh, a linear system. What do you think about what's going to happen with the eigenvalues? Two repeated real roots, um, two real roots, non-repeating. Two real roots, non-repeated. Anything yeah. more about it? Positive. Non-negative, non-zero. The negative, I mean, they're going to be going towards a solution. Oh. Right. We, should, we expect this to have an equilibrium, right? Yeah. And that should be a stable equilibrium. Everything should just be sucking in towards that equilibrium. So they should both be negative? So we should have two negative eigenvalues. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> Good interpretation. That's exactly right. And that's what you like to have on this just think, what I was just discussing was the concept that the drug problem is not unlike that, right? Do you want your drugs going off all over the place? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, uh, let's hang out Saturday. <laughs> that does have to do with receptors. But you don't want your receptors to get, get completely bound up, right? I would say every drug would kill you. That we do not want. <laughs> okay, you really want things to somehow stabilize out. All right, so, um, okay, so looking at this particular one, as I said, you've got to have this, we're keeping constant volume, so we, we better assume that we have nice standard flow rates. Okay, so flow rates balance out so that we don't uh, change the volume. Okay. Then what do we want to do? So we're going to assume, uh, again, we're assuming inert salt, that there's no reactions going on here. Uh, those get to be more interesting when you start putting chemical reactions. So you can start getting, Bless when you, you start looking at uh, jobs in things like uh, chemical plants, you then may have to take into account not only these mixing things, but you have to take into account some sorts of reactions. We talked a little bit about that with the induction problem that I gave you on your exam. That was a, type of reaction that occurs inside of a bacterial cell. So you could have complications that we won't actually get to, but that's the sort of thing we can add into it. We're thinking of a very nice inert salt, not much exciting happens here, but we still want to find out what's going on. Okay, so it's the same game that we played before. The rate of change in the amount in each of these tanks is going to be the amount entering minus the amount. Okay. So let's just go over in here. So let's just look at DA1, DA1, DT. Okay. So this is talking about tank. Obviously, we can do the same thing for tank two. All right, so what is the amount entering into tank one? F1, Q1. It's going to be F1, Q1. Anything else coming into it? F3. F3 what? F3, Q2. It's going to be C2. So it's going to be plus F3 
is C2. Okay? Now those are all the arrows pointing into the tank, the flowing in, right? Minus F4C1. So it's going to be minus F4C1. All right. And so then it'd be very easy to write the same one, same type of equation for the other. But everybody was okay with how I did it. I just simply looked at the arrows, what's going in, what's going out. Okay? And so here's what we just got through right again, right? Now, how did we change them into concentration equations before? Right. So if we want to make it into a concentration equation, I'm just going to take this whole thing and divide by V1. The other one I'm going to divide by V2, right? And so then this one would become dc1 dt is going to be equal to, well, f1q1 plus f3c2 uh, all divided by v1. And we're going to have minus f4 over v1. And so then we can make, we can make the concentration equations from the first one to the second one. And so then we can write down concentration equations very easily. It's a pretty easy process to do this. Reminding you of what we did before. So what do we have here? We have a differential equation in C1, C2. There's a C1, C2, C1, C2. C1, C2. We could write this into a matrix, right? And then, of course, this piece, those things that are coming from outside, that's a non-homogeneity, isn't it? <coughs> so this relates to basically our vector B. So here, we have these two for the outside ones. Okay, that's the non-homogeneity. Then we can see what? The C1 has a minus F4 over V1. We have a plus F3 over V1. That's times this C1, C2. And down here, we can see the C1 is the F5 over V2, right here. And the C2 is minus F3 over V2. Right? Okay. And so then we have this particular matrix. <clears throat> How would you find the equilibrium? Set it equal to zero. You set, you set that non-homogeneous equation equal to zero and solve for the equilibrium. Mm -hmm. So we can easily do that. C dot is equal to AC plus Q. So then we're just solving AC equals minus Q is going to give us our equilibrium. Solve that. All right. Could be a bit messy, right? Could definitely be a bit messy. But this is something going to plug into software. Get the results out, bang, there it is. C1 equilibrium. Now, this equilibrium has got to be positive, right? Yeah. You don't have negative solids. Okay? So, what can we see right here? Well, we can see that we better have F4 greater than F5. But if you remember, F4 was flowing in. We don't remember. F4, what does it do? It splits up into F5 and F6. Mm -hmm. So then that tells us F4 must be greater than F5. Yeah. So given, not only that, if, uh, in order to keep constant volume in there, F6 has to be greater than 0, right? So F4 has to be strictly greater than F5, right? So we're not divided by 0 either. So we've got a situation where we do have a positive equilibrium. Can you look through the cursor and it looks like it's covering up some of the things? Is there a cursor? What? what? There's no cursor. Where is my cursor? Oh, oh yeah. it wasn't covering anything. Nothing exciting. Look, 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 look at it, it's sort of or something else. So we get these, we can get this equilibrium. All this stuff, it's in, in the notes, you can, you can go to also. All 
All right, now the next thing we want to do is we want to find the eigenvalues of it, right? So we want to find the a minus lambda i uh, determinant of that equals u. The characteristic equation for this. Okay? So <coughs> we, get, we get our matrix there. We, we look at the particular flows. Again, the, the, we can see that minus f4 over v1 right here. And we can see over there, we can see the f3 over v1. And it's not too hard to see that we get the equivalent ones here. All right. <coughs> now, um, So what I want to do here is I want, I want this matrix. This matrix I have is uh, minus F4 over V1. The matrix, the next element was, uh, what am I going to have? I need to see. Uh, F3 over V1. Down here, we've got F5 over V2. And over here, I have minus F3 over V2. Right. That's my matrix A. Okay. All right. So, let me go back to the other one that I was showing. Okay. What, what about the trace of A? Positive and negative. Positive? Do you remember what the trace of A was? It's the eigenvalues added together. So it's going to be negative. We said but the eigenvalues have to be negative, didn't we? We said that, but let's, not, let's assume nothing of knowing. We don't know anything about the eigenvalues right now. We intuitively know. It's lambda 1 plus lambda 2. But what is the trace of a matrix? Lambda 1 plus lambda 2. The, eigen, the sum of the eigenvalues. <laughs> the sum of the eigenvalues. You asked Isn't it A times B? It says right there, the sum of the eigenvalues. Yeah, it says right here that the trace is equal to that. that yeah. But what is the trace oh, of the matrix? Like what does it represent? Not what does it represent. What is the trace of the matrix? Yeah. No idea. What? Is it a well? If you if you add two of the left, then you would get like a a vector that's in between two of them, right? You'd get a vector. That's Oh, uh, I said A plus, wait, wait, I say A plus B. It's the sum of the diagonal It's just the sum of the diagonal elements. How? What do you mean? How? Oh, <laughs> that's the definition. Yeah, that's, that's the definition. It's just the It ends up being, it ends up being the same. The the and it turns out that you can just add up the diagonal, yeah. and you can come up with what the sum of the eigenvalues is. Yeah. Interesting. All right. Uh, we do know what the determinant of the matrix is, don't we? Yeah. yeah. It does say it's the product of them, but it's also what? We know that the determinant of A is going to be equal to A11, A22 minus A12, A21, right? Okay. All right. So, looking at this particular matrix up here, what sign? What sign do we have for the trace? Negative. It's negative. So in this diagram here, where the trace is here, 
we're in the lower half corner, right? Yeah. We're down here. Notice what we get into down here. We're getting stable focuses, stable nodes, and saddle points. We can't get unstable nodes. We can't have a place in the middle. Okay? So we, we're, we're in that category. Now, what about the determinant of this? All right? We're taking the product of these two, okay, and we're subtracting the product of these. All right? So notice when we take the product here, we're going to have, um, let me see if I can just, they both have an F3. Okay. F4 but is greater than F3. Let me just, so let me just write it as F3, F4 minus F3, F5, all divided by V1, V2, right? Yep. F4 is greater than F3. Is that okay with the determinant? So that gives me the determinant. And we, as pointed out there, we have that F4 is greater than F5. So what's true about this one? Greater than 1. It's going to be greater than 0. Right? zero. So that tells us we're down in this quadrant here. Okay. Now the only thing I haven't computed is the discriminant. All right. And <clears throat> that's good. that would be a bit more work to do on this. But doing the discriminant, it'll turn out that we're going to be right down in this category. The discriminant is going to turn out to be greater than zero also. Will you provide us this diagram on the exam? No. Yeah. Can you put it on a note card? Yeah, you could. Can we type out the note card? I had a number of students, I had a number of students in the past who have done a photocopy of this, shrunk it, and pasted it on their card. Wait, that's allowed? That's allowed? Why wouldn't it be? That's allowed. It's just a piece of paper yeah. of a certain size. It's allowed. So I can type it out. Okay. <laughs> that's what well, that diagram is a useful diagram for being able to come up with how the behavior of your systems. Right? And so <clears throat> what I'm saying down here is we can do this. Uh, basically, that's the trace, right? The trace over there. And this, of course, is the determinant. And so based then what I've got down here is we can see that the determinant was greater than zero. As I said, it's a little bit harder. It's not real hard to show that the discriminant is greater than zero, and quite clearly, the trace is less than zero. So what this tells us is that we do have a stable node. We have two negative eigenvalues, which was intuitively we expected. That's what our intuition tells us should be true for this particular example. OK. So this particular one, uh, I think just in, in the interest of time, I'm just going to sort of go through my slides. But uh, and you, I think you've got sort of an equivalent problem at the end of this one, the homework, where you do similar things. I think it does amounts rather than concentrations. So you have to look at amount equations rather than the, uh, concentration equations. Um, but here I've got different values for Q1, Q2. I've got a 100-liter tank. Uh, I've got a 60-liter tank. We've got more concentrated stuff coming in on the right-hand side than on the left-hand side. Uh, it turned, the way I created these flows, they do satisfy the equations that, as we said, we've got to have, for example, uh, flow, flow 1 plus flow 3. So flow 1 plus flow 3 is 0.45. That one, uh, that better match. Flow four, which was, and so these have all been designed so that they add up correctly. Um, and now one can take this differential equation. I've got my v ones, I've got my v twos, I've got my flow fours, flow threes, flow fives. Uh, I can also I have the uh, non-homogeneous terms here. The non-homogeneous terms. One of them was F1, Q1 over V1. So I've got this term over here. And so I've entered in uh, decimal values there. Of course, those are rounded off. Um, and so there's the, there's the numbers. Uh, we say that we start off with uh, two grams per liter and one gram per liter so we can solve our differential equation in the end to get the whole trajectory. 
trajectories of it. <clears throat> All right. and, and of course, so then, by the way, so I've got this system, what? I could also, also I could put this into a p-plane, right? I could easily write this into p-plane and just draw the base port, portrait of it. So there I've got the one. So again, you can start with finding the equilibria. And you know, it's a bit messy, but it turns out there's the 10.85, so it's just plugging those numbers into the formula or solving solving this equals the negative of this. Oh. <clears throat> As I said, it's not very instructive for me to do the arithmetic on the on the um, Now you've got this particular. By the way, look what, look what happens if I add these two eigenvalues. All right. What if I add these two? Let's just look at the first two digits. Four, five, you're going to get eight, six, right? Wow. Wow, oh, isn't that a surprise? <laughs> Yes. Uh, just really quick, uh, I remember I asked you about the eigenvalue being one of them being zero, and you said it's a stable. It's a, it's an equilibrium. It's a line of equilibrium. Right. How does that translate? Um, do, do, will you get that if you solve for the points of equilibrium in the beginning of the problem? Like if you do the. Yes. You'll get it as well. Yeah, because what happens is. But you get a point you, though, not a. No, you don't get a point. You get a vector. What do you, you get? You get a vector because, for the for the zero, what's true. So the question you're actually getting the class ready to give me, if I were to give you the following matrix, here, if I were to give you the following matrix, A is equal to, let's just say it's a 2 minus 3. All right? And let me just say that down here, I've got 6. All right? If zero is an eigenvalue to this, what's that last entry? Oh gosh, um, three. Negative four. Negative four. These have to be what? Mul constant multiples of each other, right? Zero is an, zero is an eigenvalue. And then what does that say? It says we get, with the zero eigenvalue, you get the one eigenvector. Mm -hmm. All along that, there's no motion. OK. Let's go back to our example here. Does everybody see that I, did I, I showed you numerically that the trace, the sum of the eigenvalues gives you the trace, doesn't it? You take the product of those, and I bet you'll see it's the determinant of it. You can check that out if you want to. All right, so we get it. We get the eigenvalues. Once you've got these eigenvalues, we can easily get eigenvectors associated with it. The easiest way is to put one in the first one and solve for the other one. Okay. Uh, so we have eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And so then, what about the general solution? Well, we've got an equilibrium. We've got these eigenvectors. Let's just go back. So then I can write down, erase this. What is going to be the solution of this? I'm going to have my C1 of t, C2 of t, is going to be equal to some arbitrary constant times what? Let's put this 1 minus 0 0.7525. Yep. All right. E to the minus 0 0.0068. And then we're going to have plus a C2. 1, uh, 0 0.8859, uh, e to the minus 0 0.0068.
0.02285. And then we'll have plus the equilibrium value is 9.04. And so that would be that would be the solution, right? It would be this. And we can see as t goes to I forgot my t here. T, as, as, I, as t goes to infinity, these go to zero and we just end up with equilibrium. Exponentially decaying towards them. And so then we could then as I said, I could easily put the differential equation into P plane. Here's P plane over here. I could just put it in there. And then we can see what are, what's happening to this. Notice, by the way, because of the nature of the tank, what's going to happen is that uh, in the one direction, in the C2 direction, we've got it decaying sort of more rapidly there and then heading up this direction. And and it sort of shows the two eigenvectors, so it's going to, it's going to go uh, more rapidly in this direction than it is in this direction. So it's going to decay. So there's the one eigenvector, there's the other one. It's going to go more rapidly in this direction before it goes in that direction. Don't you use in the formula where you do the, the substitute y equals x minus x uh, uh, equilibrium for when you're solving a non-homogeneous differential equation like this? Yeah. Don't you subtract the equilibrium? So what I'm saying is this one has its equilibrium at this zero. When I subtract it, I'm, I'm translating to a different coordinate system where zero becomes the equilibrium. Oh. Oh my god. <laughs> because most of did these you get it, we did the assumption that we've done the translation and we're only looking at the origin. So if you, just, if you add it, then it puts it up in its original spot. Yeah. yeah. Translates it back. So you're bringing it to the origin. OK. Yeah. So that all of our theory we developed about the origin, right? And then we can just translate it based on the equilibrium. OK. And so there it shows the nice pretty pictures of this particular mixing problem. And all of this matches up with the stuff we had before, of course, looking at the equilibrium. So when you say a point, it's isn't it the whole entire uh, vector, like the vector space? That one, that equilibrium, if you want to think of it in time, it's that point goes out in time. Mm -hmm. So the vector's not this way. It's mm -hmm. oh crap. It's a point. The equilibrium is a point. But it's a vector. No, it's a point. But we get a vector. Oh, you're saying oh. We it's a vector in time. We can no, it's not it a spans the, the No, it's not spanning anything. What the hell? It's it's a it's a point in our C1, C2 space. Right. So if you want to think of it as a vector in C1 and C2, right. that issues a particular point. It's just a point. Oh. The equilibrium is a point. The flow in time is where those arrows go. But if you're at that point. Independent of time, you're going to stay at that. Point. Okay. All right. And so next time I'm going to move over to the diagonals. So I'm going to uh, shift, and we're going to start getting into the nonlinearities. What happens? To, how do we deal with nonlinearities? That's going to be Taylor's theorem. For a so you might want to re review Taylor's theory, Taylor, Taylor's theorem in two variables. Should have done in 252. I'm guessing it's over now.